All right, so in this video, we're going to start a new series. So uh, for those of you following along, this is now chapter 17 in our book. And chapter 17 is all about Turkic society. So Turkic societies, most of these are people who live in Central Asia. So these people have been around in our story for a long time. Uh, and Central Asia has been kind of a tangential player in our story for a long time too. Uh, so generally speaking, the people in these societies are nomadic pastoralists. And we've been talking about nomadic pastoralists pretty much since we started talking about agriculture. These are people who uh, tend to herds of animals. And they tend to travel over long distances. to find uh, food and water for their animals. And as a result of them traveling these long distances, they are often uh, used as guides for merchants and other travelers. And that's because they generally know the environment better than the people who are simply passing through. These people have lived in the environment that the merchants are just passing through. Typically, nomadic pastoralists have, uh, I guess we would call them symbiotic relationships. with settled societies. So there's usually a nice relationship of trade where the nomadic people trade meat or milk or leather or other kinds of things you can make from animals for manufactured goods they are unable to make as nomads. So anything that you would need a, a stationary location to make, they trade for with the people that don't move. So not only do they, they trade milk and meat and milk and leather, they're also used for their skills with the environment. And they often act as a kind of indirect messengers. They'll bring news because they interact with people uh, who may not get a lot of interaction. So they kind of act as uh, the go-betweens between settled societies. They, they kind of help to connect settled societies. So they kind of unofficially spread news. They might unofficially trade things. They're not really merchants, but they do trade stuff. Uh, they may unofficially uh, spread religion or culture. 
They're not doing this stuff on purpose. This is just what happens as they interact with other people. With all this being said, this is most of the relationship. So most of the relationships between settled societies and nomadic societies are relatively peaceful. However, generally in the story we've been telling, when nomadic people have come into our story, they are usually agents of disruption. And that's not necessarily fair because generally most of the relationships between pe these people are peaceful. It just happens that in our story they act as agents of disruption because in the instances of societies collapsing, the nomadic people tend to have a part in that. So, for example, we've brought up several times when a nomadic society has disrupted a settled society. We've mentioned the, the Xiongnu, for instance, who helped uh, destabilize the Han Dynasty. We've talked, or I don't think we've actually talked about them, but the Huns helped disrupt both the Roman Empire and several Indian empires. And that's not really, you know, we, we've, we've talked about these guys very early on in history, but if we want to move forward, we could talk about the Seljuk Turks. who took over the Abbasid Caliphate and then moved in to disrupt the Byzantine Empire. The same thing could be said for the Ottoman Turks who then go on to take over the Byzantine Empire. We could also mention Mahmud of Ghazni and his people, which are kind of referred to as the Ghaznavid Turks. These guys disrupted uh, Buddhist societies in India and open the door for Islam there.
So throughout our course so far, we've seen several examples of nomadic societies acting as a disruption. These are more or less the exceptions to the rule, except these exceptions are pretty noteworthy. So it shouldn't color your impression of nomadic people, but it's just that when they do act in a disruptive manner, they have a big impact on history. Remember, most of the relationships tend to be peaceful at least so far. Uh, so let's take a second and actually talk about what nomadic societies look like. Because we haven't really looked at these. We've looked at a lot of settled societies, but we haven't really looked at what nomadic societies look like. So one thing to note about nomadic societies is that they are very different. They're very different from settled societies. There is very little specialization of labor. In fact, most people learn all the jobs. So in that sense, they're kind of like hunters and gatherers. They're more generalists. There's also very little in the way of social hierarchy. There's kind of a very fluid social hierarchy. There's really only two classes. You're either a noble or a commoner. And it's really easy to switch. And mostly, the switching comes through acts of bravery or cowardice. So if, you, if you're a commoner and you do something brave, you could become a noble. And if you're a noble and you do something cowardly, you could become a commoner again. But it's also more easy to move up or down. So a noble who has dishonored himself could theoretically become a noble again by doing something brave. There is also, we won't say very little, but there is less patriarchy. And this is pretty common when we see societies that are uh, poorer. Less patriarchy is usually associated with poorer societies. And these nomadic societies don't have a lot of wealth. So there's less patriarchy. Women. have more rights and responsibilities. And there are even a few instances of female leaders. Not many, but it does, it is seen. So let's talk for a second about nomadic religion.
so the first the first idea of nomadic religion is their their uh, their native religion we'll put it like this their native religion is uh, kind of similar to Japanese Shintoism. There is a lot of nature worship. And because of this, they are usually really tolerant of other religions. And that's because they, they worship specific parts of nature. Like a specific mountain or a river. So they can't expect you to worship their mountain if you've never been to their mountain. And so they're like, oh, that's your thing. This is my thing. So they're usually pretty tolerant of other religions. And because of the nature of their native religion, they are usually quick to adopt other religions. And usually the other religions that they would adopt are those of the people that hire them. So usually merchants, which means that we get a lot of uh, Buddhists, and we also get a lot of Muslims. And it's through these religions that nomadic societies gain written languages. Because, I mean, let's be honest, nomads don't really need to write much down. That's not to say that written languages aren't useful to them. It's just that they didn't really need them. When they get written languages, they use them. It's just not something that they would have naturally needed. Another thing that we need to talk about in terms of religion is the general conversion to Islam. So a lot of Turkic people converted to Islam. Uh, some of that came through interactions with merchants. But even more, happened through the impressment into the Abbasid army. Impressment is like a forced draft. So they've been drafted into the Abbasid army. And so when these Turkic people were forced into joining the Abbasid army, a lot of them converted to Islam. So we're going to end this by saying that 
as nomadic societies, saw the wealth of settled societies start to grow and grow quickly, nomadic societies are more likely to want to take that wealth and they start to settle themselves. And in our next video, we will look at a specific group of nomadic Turkic people through this process. So they will be nomadic and they'll start to interact more with settled societies. We'll start to see them attack the settled societies, take that wealth, and then we'll start to see them settle down. So we will see that in our next video. So we'll follow that trajectory in our next installment. So until then, this is Mr. Nissen signing off.